Yes, and my name's Shane Gowan. I'm from um, Australia, down south. Um, I first got into pig hunting close to 20 years ago, so I use the dogs mainly for hunting purposes. Um, I've had various breeds, oh, pretty much every breed under the sun we can get around this area I've had. Um, I first got in, discovered the bull Arab in my area um, probably close to 15 years ago. The reason I started using bull Arabs was they were a great all-around dog. Um, they can find a pig on hot scent. They can track a cold scent. They can hold the pig till you get there. They've got good stamina. They're good around the kids. They're good at home. And I found them to be a great all-around dog. Um, always had higher success with the bull Arabs. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've even gone back to crossbreds and other breeds, and I always found the bull Arab to be the better, better dog the better dog to breed from if you get the genuine bull Arab. Um, so I just stuck, I stuck with the bull Arab basically. Mm -hmm. Not being stubborn, I've just, I've always had higher success rate in catching pigs and hunting and doing what I do with the bull Arab. And mm -hmm. that's why I prefer to use the bull Arab to catch pigs and hunt down here. Mm -hmm. And what kind of breeds did you have growing up? Um, I had... It was like a Pitbull Cross American Staffy I thought was pretty good at the time. It lacked in stamina. It did certain things that the Bull Arab would do. I've also had Stag Hound Cross Bull Terriers. I've had Boxer Cross Bull Terriers. They're always a good dog, good, hard, fast dog. Um, I've had Wolf Hounds. I've had Baleen Dogs. Kelpies were really good, high energy. So the mountains around my area can be quite steep and thick. Uh -huh. um, the most effective way to flush the wild pigs out and to catch the wild pigs are to use the dogs to find and catch them rather than baiting methods, rather than trapping methods, mm -hmm. um, all that sort of stuff. The dogs are quite are very effective to catch the wild pigs in the terrain that we, we're in. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a um – more of a sporting way of of doing things, correct? It's kind of like you're you're allowing the dog to do its job. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And the dog enjoys doing it. The dog loves doing it. Um, it. It's just more natural for them. You could you could basically train the bull Arab to do whatever you want. People have trained them to catch kangaroos, to have to catch wild scrubbles, um, to work them on cattle, all that sort of stuff, but. The particular reason I use them is is for wild pigs. Mm -hmm. You 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 pretty much fill your freezer with the, with the pigs that you catch, and correct? You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got um, pork roasts in the freezers. I've got salamis we make, prosciutto we make. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, steaks, pork steak, a lot of cooking sausages. The the fat in the pork is really good, especially the back fat, the shoulder fat. Mm -hmm. um, good in the cooking sausages all that sort of stuff even in the salamis um so yeah we, we don't waste much food the dogs it's really good for the dogs it's good, good protein good good fat good energy for the dogs so they get a good balanced diet and pork mm. is definitely one of the diets i use in my my dogs and my bull arabs and they do really well and people don't know that uh, wild boar meat is is much healthier than um, farm raised pigs. They don't yeah. they don't real they don't realize how much healthier the the meat is for us humans, and probably yeah. for the dog as well. Yeah. Everyone's got the conception that they're all full of diseases. They eat dead kangaroos and carcasses, which, if they're hungry, they will. They're a very adaptable animal. They don't just need to eat meat. They'll graze on plants and fruit. Mm -hmm. They love especially this time of year down, down my way, every all the fruits in season, wild apple trees, blackberry bushes, all that sort of stuff. And the pigs go mad. They've got quite a good flavour. They hold good fat. Um, by all means, they're not, they're definitely not disease ridden, especially mm -hmm. in my area. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's probably very important for people who have farms and stuff to to keep the population in, in control, and that's where people like yourself uh, are doing uh, yeoman's work with the conservation, correct? Oh, we can have a doubt. Like, 
you have farmers ringing you up screaming like, when the hell are you getting out here? We need to get these pigs gone. They've just put a crop in and um, the the pigs have come down and destroyed it, mm-hmm. you know. Like, they eat lambs. Basically, the ewe is trying to give birth to a lamb and a pig will come out and kill the lamb and then eat the lamb. Like, it's mm-hmm. money. Um, if, you, if you let the pig over, they can do great like massive amounts of damage mm-hmm. um, in places like that. Mm-hmm. Even um, out in the wild, they'll eat like native frogs and, and that sort of stuff, plants, mm-hmm. and they dig up the dirt. There's no topsoil on the ground once they rip up the dirt to eat their worms. It's mm-hmm. very hard for, for growth to come back after that with no topsoil, topsoil and all that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so a lot of farmers do call upon you and, and uh, to come out with your dogs. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that so a lot of your hunts are, are kind of planned that way? Um, not always. They're not always planned that way. There are a lot of state forests around here, which we can just, if you've got the license to hunt the state forest, you can book in and go whenever you want just to work your dogs for fitness, just to train train the younger dogs to catch the pigs. Mm-hmm. Um, there's all sorts of things. It's becoming quite of a sport in Australia too now. People are doing it because they enjoy doing it. They like getting out in the bush. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's different several different reasons. So 1970s, there was a fellow called early 1970 Mike Hodgins. He was in far north Queensland of Australia, which mm-hmm. is up higher in the main country. Um, he he had a – there wasn't many dogs in Australia in the 1970s. It was quite hard to import dogs back then. Mm-hmm. He started off with a, gray, a female greyhound dog. He, he mm-hmm. crossed that with a German short hair pointer male, which mm-hmm. created the uh, – which created a greyhound cross Sherm, uh, German short hair. He kept a male out of that litter, and he put the male over a female bull terrier bitch. Mm-hmm. So then, basically, from there, that created the first pair of bull Arabs. Um, Mike Hodgins had several mates around far north Queensland, which he'd sell dogs to, and then mates had swap dogs, um, breed their dogs. If someone had a good working dog on pigs they liked, they'd put it over their dog, and they kept creating through that. And then several people bought dogs off Mike Hodgins. One in particular was Peter Paulson. He added, I think in the early 1980s, a dash of English pointer, and he also added the bloodhound into the breed. Mm-hmm. So five breeds that make up the bull Arab. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, then far back in the day, English bull terrier was re-added, um, but it hasn't gone any further than those five breeds. Um, so the last 40 plus years, there's been recorded history of matings from bull Arab to bull Arab mating which makes a genuine bull Arab what is today. If someone tried to recreate the breed with mm-hmm. the original breeds of dog in it, it would simply be known as a greyhound, cross pointer, cross bull terrier, cross bloodhound. If someone got, got a genuine bull Arab now and mm-hmm. crossed it with one of the original breeds, so they got a, for example, they got a pure breed, a, a genuine bull Arab and they put a pointer over it, it would simply be known as a, Arab cross pointer. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it's developed its own genetic makeup now. Yeah, there'd be enough genetics now to do a DNA test. There's mm-hmm. enough in the pool to, to prove that. Although they're not um, a registered purebred yet, um, there's there's many things in place, protocol and all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we are getting there though. Right. Um, do you know the percentages of uh, bull terry that are, are are in the bull Arab? It's very hard to say a percentage of. So we can't say twenty five percent bull terrier. We can't. A lot of people get it wrong. They say twenty five percent greyhound, twenty five percent German short hair pointer, fifty percent bull terrier, which is not always the case. Mm-hmm. Um, 
if you were to cross a greyhound to a bull terrier, you can't say that dog is 50% greyhound and 50% bull terrier. What you'll get in a litter, you'll get some pups. They're all greyhounds cross bull terrier, but some pups will be throw more to the bull terrier. Some pups will throw more to the greyhound. So to say it's 50% greyhound and 50% bull terrier, I don't like using that sort of terminology or anything like that. So it's very hard to say that. Um, and, and over the years, breeders have put their own stamp on the breed. If they prefer more the bull terrier type of dogs, they'll breed to more the bull terrier type of dogs. They're still, bull, they're still genuine bull Arabs, but with selective breeding in their line, they may have a more bull terrier type of bull Arab. Another breeder has bred from the exact same blood. He's choosing the more nosier, deeper voice, bigger ears, the pointer side, the more bloodhound side. His line will be more of the hound side. So even though it's the same genetics that make up the dog, over the years, um, different lines of breeders have their slight stamp on, on the breed, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Right. Not, not every bull Arab is going to be exactly the same height, exactly the same colour, um, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's up to the and the breeder how, where, what type of area he hunts in is how he wants to breed his dog for that. Um, mm-hmm. The breeds I use, they're a good all-round breed, so I can basically take them to any part of Australia and they'll succeed. Some people like the smaller types in the thicker bush, but they only hunt the thicker bush. Some people like the bigger, taller, leggier, faster ones in the open country because they only hunt the open country. My The, the dogs I have are just a good all-round structure, size and ability, so... If I do hunt any part of Australia, I can take them dogs and we'll succeed. I'm not saying they're the best in every area. Obviously, a smaller, quicker dog will go better in the thicker stuff. A taller, leggier dog will be better than my dogs in the open stuff. It'll get to the pig quicker. But the fact I like is they're a good all-round dog. They will succeed in any part of Australia. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, what are they like when uh, they're on the property and in around the home? Are they uh, are they very energetic, or do do they have kind of that ability to to shut it down? Um, in my opinion, they definitely have the ability to shut it down. But my dogs get worked two or three times every week on big hunts, so when they're at home, they enjoy their rest. They enjoy the home. Enjoy playing with the children. Yeah. And the gentleman that uh, originally created the breed, his main purpose was the the, the boar hunting. Um, not so much boar hunting. Yes, it was boar hunting, but it was also to cra- uh, catch wild scrub bulls in the far north Queensland. Um, so basically, predominantly yes, for pigs, wild boars, but also had a couple of uses to work on cattle and also to catch wild bulls and, and sometimes, yeah, things like that. Right. Is there any other uh, jobs today that uh, people are using the bull herb for or thinking about using them for? Not really anymore. There are a lot of people that like them just as a purely as a companion dog, which is fine. Um, when they're trained to be a companion dog, they can be ec- an excellent house dog just as a pet or whatever um so it has taken that path back mm-hmm. in the early 90s, late 80s even late 70s um people um were using them to cull kangaroos on properties mm-hmm. that had weight kangaroos that were doing damage they they used them for kangaroos but lately they're either your pig dog um or they're simply a companion dog mm-hmm. the the dogs i have are, are both in my opinion they're a companion they're a pet they're a family dog and they're a hunting dog mm-hmm. right uh do you do you think that uh say somebody uh in an urban environment here in the united states could could uh train a bull arab to do say something like protection work um, I think they could. I think you could 
train a bull Arab to do whatever you wanted it to, in my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it listed on protection work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got no no experience in that field, but I don't see why not. Mm-hmm. Do you know of anybody uh, in the United States that, that, that has some uh, bull herbs that are maybe using them for uh, boar hunting? I found out that people in the United States have been given what they think or bought, purchased what they think is a bull Arab, mm-hmm. but I don't believe what genuine bull Arabs in, Austra- in, in the state, sorry. I think it would be good to see some genuine bull Arabs go over there. Mm-hmm. So Arab is not genuine. Whether they've been used on pigs properly or not, I can't really answer that. About the bull Arab, you don't need your bay dog. You don't need your catch dog or your running catch dog. The bull Arab is a great all-round dog. It does mm-hmm. everything. It the scent, and it can go on a hot scent. It can also track a cold scent, like I was saying earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it can hold a pig one out or work in a pack. Um, you, it's just good. You don't. They're a good all-round dog, so you don't need to have two or three different types of dogs in your in your pack. Right. And it, Without a doubt, they would fit in quite well, especially with the right owner and trainer yeah. to train them to. Do it. So they can't just expect to buy a bull or a pup, take it out into the field and catch seven pigs. So yeah. they really, they if they know what they're doing and they train it properly like they would with their other dogs. They would have great success. So then they're nat- they're naturally going to want to hunt. Um, my advice is there's a thousand different animals in the bush. You need to discipline them and train them correctly so they just catch the particular animal you want them to catch. Mm-hmm. They're a game. If you want them to catch deer, they'll catch deer. So basically, what whichever animal you choose, pigs in, in this case, you have to really concentrate and steer them into the direction of pigs. They've, they've, got, they've got a lot of energy. Um, once you can channel their energy into the pigs and pigs only and you teach them that, through discipline and also encouragement. Encouragement is one of the main things. When they're catching pigs, you need to encourage them to do it. They'll, they'll want to do it for you and also for themselves, and you'll have great rewards. Mm-hmm. They will be a registered breed. There's al- almost 50 to fifty years of Arab to Arab matings. Mm-hmm. Um, more than enough evidence back in the day, technically. They're not a registered breed breed yet but regardless if everyone if anyone follows through with pushing for arabs to be registered they've already exceeded what's required genetically to be recognized as a breed it's it's only down to paperwork and protocol now in mm-hmm. australia quite hard in australia um oh. being a government body and holding and recording the matings with no outcrosses and no other breeds which is this has been happening um there's two registries in australia now um, Australian Bull Arab Association and Australian Bull Arab Animal Registry, I think it is. These have only been going for around nine years. We need to get up to 15 years of actual recorded matings through these organisations to get them a registered breed mm-hmm. in Australia, also worldwide. Right. And do you think that would um, uh, be beneficial for the breed? It would stop a lot of arguments um, and it would stop a lot of people selling fake bull Arabs just because they look like a bull Arab. They're selling them as a, as a bull Arab. They're not, not, not from a proven hunting line or anything like that. So it would be beneficial. Mm-hmm. It would cut out these people trying to make money on selling fake dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, the dog can come with legitimate paperwork then, um, fully genuine, fully registered, um and and it'd get rid of all these breeders eliminate all the bad breeders mm-hmm. so yes it would be beneficial right that's the australian bull arab breeders association its primary goal is to eliminate or at least if we can highlight the imitator breeders and mm-hmm. the cross breeding a lot of people are breeding saying near enough is good enough and that's not right um yeah, if we can eliminate all that, like where that's, that's why if we can get them registered, it's definitely going to help in that. Basically, what you're saying. Yeah, like um, 
it can be down to minus 15 degrees down here in winter. Mm -hmm. um, hunt fine. As long as you've got good kennels, good bedding when they're sleeping at night, while they're hunting in the minus 15 degree snow and stuff like that, or the real icy nights, um, or blizzardy nights, they're fine. If we take them up to Darwin or up to Queensland where it can be up to 50 degrees sometimes, they can also handle that. Although you, you need to be selective when you hunt these dogs. You don't want to go out on your 40 degree days because they are, they can be a long range finder and they're a hard dog. They're not your bay dog or what we call a bailing dog. Mm -hmm. It's a recipe for disaster having the hard dog and the long range finder together because you may not see that dog for half a day, it could be on a pig, maybe longer at times. Mm -hmm. By the time, it could be quite exhausted. So, yes, they can handle the high extreme temperatures, but you, if hunting in those ex temperatures, you need to be really careful. Right. I, look, the bull mm -hmm. Arab can do everything one out when it comes to wild bulls. They can, they can catch and hold up to 200 kilo pig, no dramas. But it's always safer to have an extra dog or even three dogs there in a pack working that animal. Um, and you'll find your dog will pull up a lot better the next day and the next week. I find whatever pack you put them into, they adapt. Um, I've never seen a bad one yet, but like all breeds, I've always said, and I believe this, it comes down to the owner, the way it's trained, the way it's raised, the way it's handled. Mm -hmm. A lot of with dogs can be a psychological thing between the owner and the dog. Um, they need to know that you're the boss. They're not the boss. Um, like any breed, they'll fit in perfectly. They're, they're a one-out dog. They just want to hunt. They love hunting. When they're on the back of that ute or in the bush walking, they know their job. They prefer to do their job than to worry about getting into a fight with another dog. And how do they do, like, when they're back home uh, with uh, smaller dogs and, or cats? Do they Are they able to live harmoniously with each other? Yeah, they're, they're more than fine. I've got chooks out in the back. I let the chooks out. I let the dogs out. Um, my neighbour's got a cat that jumps a fence quite often. We've always got wild birds flying around. They're, they're, they're fully – they're a highly trained animal. They're fully yeah. stock-proof. No, no interest in other dogs. You bring a little dog in. I've seen little dogs try to attack the bull Arabs, and the bull Arabs just—they don't care. They just walk away. Like <clears throat> if you have a, an owner, a particular owner that doesn't know how to handle the dog correctly or encourages something like that, well, yes, you are going to have an issue. Right. I feed them a good balanced diet. Um, in winter, because it, it does get quite cold here where where I hunt. Um, they need more fat rather than anything for mm -hmm. their energy to hold their weight. Um, they'll need to be fed twice a day. Some is a different story. Once a day, um, I find chicken carcass, I get that minced. I, they digest it quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, if we mix it with kibble, I don't try not to use much kibble, but when I do, I always make sure it's a good quality kibble. Mm -hmm. depends on the dog. Um, the younger pups... They usually grow fast and they grow quick into their big structure. Um, they'll need a slight bit more calcium than what the older dog will need. Um, look, I, I just give them a good balanced diet and they seem mm. to work well. I don't proportion the food every day. I go by eye. I think that's the best way. They're looking a bit skinny. You, you gradually increase their feed over time. You don't just give them one or two big feeds and they're back to normal. If they're mm. looking like they're much weight you do the exact opposite instead of just not feeding them for three days you you cut back gradually daily so i believe you have to go by eye you need to know how hard the dog's working if it's not being worked that hard and it's and it's not that cold probably a more protein diet would suit the dog it really depends on the time of year and how hard you're hunting that dog i believe if you're going on your big massive hunts you're going to get several big pigs back to back and you need your dog to back up every day Things like your carb loading with your dog can be good. Um, your rice, your boiled eggs, stuff like that. I, I believe if you give them a good balanced diet, um, decent quality food, that's all they need. Mm -hmm. That's all they need. It doesn't have to be anything in particular. You don't have to overdo them with vitamins or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. The main thing 
parasite free, no worms, no fleas, all that sort of stuff. They're regularly vaccinated. Mm-hmm. It's got it got a nice coat on it. It's good to go. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, do they uh, with the short coat? Do you ever have any uh, issues with their with their skin, or are they just due to their rustic nature? They they're okay with out in the climates. Yeah, look, like they're they're fine. Um, they do take a couple of days to adapt. Say if you go from extreme cold to extreme heat, they will need a couple of days to get used to that heat. But once mm-hmm. they once they're used to it, they're fine. Their skin doesn't really come in into it. Um, they can hold their heat in winter. Although once you start getting your zero or minus zeros, um, it's a good idea to put a jacket on them. Mm-hmm. Through the night, through the day, even when they're not in laying in sun, I believe they need to lay in sun a few hours every day at least. Um, but look, at it, they handle it fine. It doesn't hurt to put a jacket on them, though. How many dogs do you have right now? Well, I have five in my backyard at the moment. Yeah. And what's kind of your uh, your daily routine with your dogs? Uh, like, say, when you're not going to hunt, what uh, do you exercise them or, or do any kind of training or is just uh... – you let them rest exercise wise because i do regularly hunt i try and go two to three times a week that's enough exercise for me i don't like to over exercise them if i do believe they're getting a bit worn out or burn out i'll cut back on their hunting i'll rotate dogs i won't rotate i won't hunt a dog as hard as it should if i believe it needs a rest if Mm -hmm. anything it doesn't need more exercise what it does is enough Mm -hmm. um you get up an hour before work i let them all out I give them their fresh water, fill their buckets up. If I'm not going hunting that night, I will give them a feed in the morning and night. If I am going hunting that afternoon, I don't. I might give them a small feed. Um, our routine is different on the age of the dog. Usually when I first get a small pup, I, I like to do the basic sit, stay, wait for your food method. Once mm-hmm. the body has grown up and, I, and know it can handle jumping on the back and on, off and on a ute tray, tray of a ute, Mm-hmm. Um, once I'm ready, I'll, I'll spend a couple of hours every day with each dog, getting them on the ute, getting them off the ute on command, getting them into the dog crate, getting them out of the dog crate on command, teaching them simple things around the house, what to do, what not to do. Um, yeah, you, you need to spend a lot of time with them to get the best mm-hmm. result. Like any dog, the more you put in, the more you'll get out. Right. And does your uh, your whole family get involved? Um, I've got two young kids. They have no choice because my mo- my wife likes coming hunting, so if she comes with me, they have to come pretty much. But they enjoy it. They enjoy the dogs. They've, they, when they were born, they were all raised around dogs the first day we got them home. That yeah, they they love the dogs. Um, the dogs love them too. They go out there, and sometimes I've come in the backyard. And the dog's been painted green and things like this. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. What does uh, what does your uh, kennel setup look like? Um, with my older dogs, I raise the kennels off the ground. They're all completely enclosed, but I do have individual doors, so I can I can open all doors and all dogs can go into any run, or I can also individually lock up the kennels. So with my older dogs. Um, or with the working dogs, they're, they're raised off the ground, probably a foot foot off the ground. Um, they've got a nice bed out of the wind, flaps on their door so no breeze can get through at night time. Um, and they've got to run outside their kennel so individually they can, they've got about a four metre by four metre run. Um, with, the, with the bitches um, that I like to breed from, they'll have also a kennel, but it'll be more of a whelping box type run it's got yeah. um boards or rail around the edge so if they do have pups they can't squash the pups on the edge but it's also set up so i can get in from on top of the kennel or i can close it so when they don't have pups it's it's basically a kennel for them anyway so they're comfortable in there so when they're ready to have pups that's where they'll have them yeah and then i've got a little puppy run that's you know each each run's got a roof over the top of it um, fully enclosed, they can't get out from the sides, top, anywhere, even if they mm-hmm. tried. Puppy runs a bit smaller, it's a bit easier for me to get in there. When I do have pups, at the moment I don't have pups. Um, so, yeah, basically that's what it is. Nice and warm and cosy. 
always carpeted. Um, when when I believe the carpet needs replacing, I put new carpets on or put new flaps on the kennel. The the line of dog I I run my boy Arab, they're a Brian Neal line. Uh-huh. So Brian Neal started breeding these early 1990s, so he's been going for almost 30 years now. Um, in my opinion, they're they're a good all round line, and they're also a genuine line. He hasn't added any particular breeds. All his breeds. All his dogs he's used go back to the genuine ones, and that's all been recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a great all-round line. Um, if I breed my two bull Arabs, say if I've got a Brian Neal bull Arab male and a Brian bull Arab female, they're a Brian bull Arab line, but they're not bred by Brian Neal. So if I go to sell them to friends or whatever, I'll say parents of Brian Neal bull Arabs, but the uh-huh. pups aren't. I selected that breeding. He didn't select that breeding. Right. So yeah, I have bred from him. I have no intention of starting my new, my own line. If I need a new dog or I want to breed from a dog, I'll breed my own, or I'll just buy another one off Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, possibly in the future. Um, he may not be around forever. If that's the case, I'll I'll have to start. Um probably breeding my own more. Um, I just don't trust many other bull Arab breeders in Australia, which is unfortunate. If we could get this, um, get them registered as a breed, I think that would definitely help. But don't yeah. get me wrong, there are still a, a few, a number of great bull Arab breeders in Australia, mm-hmm. um, but the number of not so good weighs up the good ones, unfortunately. If it wasn't a bull Arab what what breed interest what give me a couple breeds that interest you besides the bull Arab? I really like I, I do like the stag hound. Um I've had quite quite a success with the stag hound. They're quite fast. Um they're great on a hot scent. They don't they don't so much track a cold scent far, um which is good. Um they they're quite they're a good all-round dog. Um, I do prefer the stag hound cross with something like a bull terrier or something like that. It, give, it hardens them, gives them a bit more drive. The thing I do find with the stag hound, though, it does have high prey, high prey drive. So as well-trained as they are, occasionally they will chase something they shouldn't and they're not supposed to. They're not as natural, in my opinion. And they're not as easy naturally to train for pigs where the bull Arabs been bred to train for pigs through selective breeding. So it's kind of in their genetics where the stag hounds are good, good all round dog with any game. Um, that, and they are great on pigs. Um, so yeah, if the bull Arab wasn't around these days, I'd probably go to a bull terrier cross stag hound. Oh. Yeah. I do find the stamina doesn't compare to the bull Arab. The bull Arab will blow their stamina away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Shane, and, I, and uh, good luck with the hunts. And um, yep. And uh, we'll talk to you in a little bit. Thanks. Sounds good. See you, mate. See you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.